five, if you will, this morning. That's where we're going to get started. Wonderful. One of the nice things about having my office right there is when you forgot your notes, they're right there. So that's what the step into the closet was. So anyway, but it is good to see everybody this morning. Matthew chapter 25 is where we're going to begin looking this morning. We've been talk we introduced the subject last week on eternal judgment. And I did so not because I think we have to have a lot of correcting about the issue of eternal judgment and hell and lake of fire, but rather we have to have some clear understanding of it. And the wonderful thing about dwelling in Christ alone and dwell and living that song's some of the phrase phrasing in that song we just sang is wonderful living with the cloudless sky, all of that comes from knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And when you have that, you have that clarity of thought, then when things come up, like the issue of eternal judgment, we can then come along and say, well, wait a minute, what does Scripture say about this? The great verse in Romans 4 where Paul is talking about Abraham and he says, what saith the Scripture? And that's really what it says, what does the Scripture say? And then we're going to judge everything off of that. And as we look at this issue of eternal judgment, this morning we're asking the, going to answer the question of why did God even create hell? And there's a real clear reason why. Excuse me, why? We, and, and again, he, we understand because of sin, the wrath of God comes upon that unbeliever. But there's something in it that we need to understand specifically about this issue of why did God even create hell, the lake of fire, eternal punishment, eternal damnation? What was going on in the, in the, in the beginning? What was happening here? And it, this issue really speaks to the heart of everything when you have a conversation about doctrine, especially the doctrine of eternal judgment, clearly understanding why he even created it to begin with helps then with everything else in the conversation. In Matthew 25, you have the Lord uh, in, in really the second Olivet Discourse, if you will, here. And he's, he, in, the whole of Matthew is dispensational in, the, in, in tenor and in tone. And he's taking the apostles and he's in the little flock and he's getting them ready for the 70th week of Daniel. He's getting them ready for that. And at the end of that, verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So the second coming has happened. We're sitting over now in the millennial kingdom. Okay? Now, by the way, next week we're going to look at the issue of hell in time past, and then we'll do the ages to come, and then we'll do the but now, okay? So we're going to look at it dispensationally. Last week and this week is the doctrinal issues. You've got to get this fundamental doctrinal line down. So here we are in the millennial kingdom, the beginning of it, second coming. He's, he's sitting on his throne. He calls the nations together, verse 32. And before him were gathered all nations, all of the Gentiles. Israel is not here. In this calling, Israel, the true Israel of God, is sealed. They're in the kingdom. They're off doing. He calls the the nations together, and he separates one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So he's going to lay them out, and there's this great conversation to the sheep. He says, "Because you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me." And he's imposing, he's executing the Abrahamic covenant. The covenant of, if you bless my people, I will bless you. If you curse my people, I will curse you. And he's laying out the Abrahamic covenant, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left, these will be the goats, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angel. So why did God create hell? For the devil and his angels. Let's pray and go to lunch early, right? I wish it was that simple. Okay, unfortunately it's not, but that's, he doesn't prepare hell originally. The the preparation of hell is not for man. But rather he prepared it way before man was ever created, and it's for the devil and his angels. And there's a thing here in, in, in timing. If you look there at verse 46, by the way, they ask him, why do we get hell? And he says, well, because you didn't do this to the least of my brethren. You didn't do it to me. In other words, you didn't bless them. You cursed us. 
So then I'm cursing you. Verse 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment. And that punishment, that's the issue. It's everlasting. It's going to go on and on, world without end. And, I'm sorry, but the righteousness into life eternal. So there's a conflict here that is established way before the mankind ever existed between God and Satan, and it, and it has brought the issue of eternal judgment and an eternal fire and eternal punishment to the forefront. So there's an issue here that we need to see that's concerning this angelic host. Now come over to Colossians 1. That's concerning the issue of creation and again, before man was created. Because what happens in the argument against hell, you know, don't say hell, you're going to offend somebody. Don't say this, don't do that. How can a, remember, we were talking last week about how can a loving God do this? Well, the love of God is never far from you. It, you never get too far away from the love of God that he can never get you. The love of God never lets you down. It never disappoints you, but ultimately it will never let you off. It'll never let you off the hook. It holds you accountable. So when people, when you hear people spew, well, uh, the God of love wouldn't do this. No, that, they're talking out of something that they heard somebody or read somewhere. They're not talking from Scripture. They're talking from a viewpoint, an opinion, because we don't want to offend. You know. And again, in our culture today, that's a big push to be, to be non-offensive. But when you come into Scripture, it's really clear that God has established, He created hell for a very specific reason. In Colossians 1, you have Paul begin to pull back the curtain of the heavenly places. And he describes how God created a governmental system in the beginning. Colossians 1, verse 15. Who, and that's going to be the one in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's going to be the end of verse 13. Here's His dear Son. So whom, His dear Son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created. Now watch how He's going to define the all things for you. Whether that are in heaven and that are in earth. Notice it's heaven, singular, not heavens. So now we are in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, Genesis 2-1 has heavens. Why? Because there's been the creation of the second and third, first heaven. But here, Paul takes us back to before Genesis 1-2, where he starts to create. He takes us back into 1 1. And he says in 1 1, he says, hey, back there, he created a system, a governmental structure. Things that are in earth, things that are, I'm sorry, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Well, what would be visible? The earth, the invisible, the heavens. Now, you guys are going to get a theological degree today. And there's, there's step one. This stuff isn't hard. You know what's hard about this stuff? Believing it. That's really what it, it the book is clear, but we got to believe it. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. What's happening here? All of, uh, in creation, in Genesis 1-1, when God created, what did he create in 1-1? He created, Amos 9, verse 6 says, he, he laid the stories in heaven. Stories as in levels. A ten-story building. That idea, not stories as in, you know, hey, did you hear the one about the guy who walked in the bar and blah, blah, blah. He's not that. He's talking about, hey, here's rank and authority. Here's structure. And he does it. Way back before he ever created man. Come back with me to Job 38, just real quick. Yesterday, Job 38, in the men's fellowship, we started talking about the, the period between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And uh, in, in that, this passage, 
was a, part, a component in it because you got to check the timing of it. Job 4, 38, verse 4. Job, the Lord is talking to Job. And he's asking Job to think like a man would think. Think like humanity. A create, you're, you're a man. How did, how, where were you? Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Where were you, Job, when I created heaven and earth? 1-1, one, one, Genesis 1-1. One, one. Where were you, Job? Well, Job wasn't there. Man wasn't there. Man doesn't show up till chapter 1, verse 6. The, or, I'm sorry, the, the sixth day of chapter 1. Verse 6 is like day 2, I think. Okay? Where were you, Job? Job? Like, I wasn't there. Job has to say, you were there. You created. In the beginning, God created. Now watch verse 7. I woke her up. That's good. That's an amen right there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, look at verse 7. When, now watch this, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Several things to catch in verse 7. Notice the word when. Job, were you there when I laid all the creation out? And when the morning stars and the sons of God, compo- different classes of the angelic realm. By the way, notice all the sons of God. This is pre-fall of Satan. Satan is the son of the morning, Lucifer. We'll see it in, in, in Isaiah 14. He's the leader of the group of the morning stars. He's the head guy. All the sons of God, the angelic realm, what do they do? They watch God create heaven and earth. But what did he create? Thrones, dominions, powers, principalities, mights, rulers. He created a governmental structure. Why? Well, because he doesn't let creation just run amok. He's got order to it. He's got structure to it. So when we understand that the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the head of the creation... He created positions of governmental rank and authority. He doesn't leave creation to just do whatever they want to do. And he does it all prior to man ever showing up. Oh, can I show you something? You want to, this is just, come over to, look, look at Genesis 1. Uh, I just, I hit this last hour at the end of an, end of Sunday school. Look at Genesis 1 and get Genesis 6. No, nine. Eh, you had nine. You, folks, the wisdom of God is so wonderful when you, and you can understand it. You can grasp it. You can see it. You can stand in awe of it. Look at Genesis 1, verse 28. And God blessed them, Adam and Eve. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have what? Dominion. Why would he have to tell Adam to go have to subdue something and to have dominion? What's going on? We got an enemy. We have an adversary. Psalms 8 in place. Adam, your job is to go out there and establish human government in the earth for me. You're my guy. That's what you're to do. Subdue it, have dominion over it. Now, what happens? A couple chapters later, Adam and Eve fall. Now come to Hebrews or, uh, Genesis 9. Man gets wicked. God floods the earth, kills everybody but Noah and his three boys and their family. They get off the boat. They have a big altar party. The Lord says, you know what? Look, look, at, look at 821. Genesis 8, 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I have done. You know what he's saying there? Man, the condi- human condition will never change. The only way to change human condition is Calvary. 
And the only way you can get someone to Calvary is to understand that there is an eternal judgment coming their way. Follow me? Okay. Because he did something way over here prior. And I kind of jumped ahead. But look at chapter 9. Noah gets off the boat. 9-6, the Lord establishes capital punishment. He establishes nationalism. Okay? Verse 7, look at what he says to Noah. And you, be ye fruitful, and multiply, and subdue, and have dominion over. See how subdue and dominion are not listed? Because it's not Noah's job to establish human government. God just did it. And he's going to give it to the issues of the nations. Chapter 10. Why is he doing all that? Why does he establish human government? Why does he establish the governmental structure at all? Well, because there's a guy in it that's causing trouble. Come over to Ezekiel chapter 28. Lucifer, Satan, the devil, the dragon, Leviathan, the crooked serpent. He's got a ton of different names depicting different times and characteristics. But when we begin to understand of why God created hell, we begin to look at this guy because he's the instigator. He's the one that started the rebellion against God's governmental structure. There's always one. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been and eaten the garden of God. Now stop there. Right off the bat, you know that the king of Tarsus was not in the garden of Eden. So obviously he's not. Historically in time, Ezekiel is talking to the king of Tyrus. He's standing there. But who is he? He's a man. Prophetically, who's he talking to? The guy behind the man running the show. That satanic pulling the strings. The course of this world. Why? Because who was in the garden? Adam and Eve, the serpent, Satan, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that. So obviously, the king of, by the way, if the king of Tyrus was there, he's a really old man here. <laughs> he's at least, anyway. Now watch verse 13. Every precious stone was I covering, the sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. He is the anointed cherub that covereth, verse 14. He's the most beautiful creature of the angelic realm. He's the top man. He's the top guy. And the, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Always remember that. Satan is a created being. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked to and fro in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now, stop right there. Now, let's think about Satan for just a minute. Who is this guy? The workmanship of thy tabrets, the pipe organ. He's the anointed cherub that covereth. He's the top guy. He's, he's the anointed one. When you do out the, the word study on that, he's a Christ. That's what he is. An anointed one, Christ. He's a, he's a Christ. He's the, he, it's God, then Lucifer, and then everybody else. He's right there. And he, he's the one that covereth. He's the highest ranking. He's a sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He has all of those, that, that, the, the, the gems there, the Gemini, so that when light shines through him, it's just a radiant, beautiful wonderful thing. I don't know if you've ever taken light and shined it off a diamond and look at all the different colors that come and produce. And here he is. He hits that and he's just gorgeous. He's the primo, the top created being. His job with the tabrets and the pipes was to lead the creation 
all of the creatures in creation in this song and praise, Job 38, 7, of glorifying and, and in awe of the Creator as He creates. That was His job. His job was to get out there and His... It's fascinating when you study God and the issue of volition and free will and how He let cre- His creatures have it. And Satan would... Lucifer would lead the creation and go, you know what, that was good, let's, go, let's even get it better, guys, next time. And boom! But what does verse 15 say happened? Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. Till what? Till something happened. Till iniquity. When God created the angelic realm, He created a system of authority and structure in the universe, and He, he put a cherub at the top of it. He's the anointed cherub who's, who was involved in the rulership and the, the direction of the heavenly host. And he was perfect till iniquity was found in him. By the way, just for you guys who like word studies, you take that word iniquity, and every place you find it, it's an association somewhere in the context with the satanic policy of evil. Every time. I've yet to find one where it's not. Why? Because that's what he did. He, it's iniquity. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. Paul, yeah, I was going to quote it and it just slipped my brain, which is easy to do today. 1 Timothy 3, hold on to Ezekiel there. Verse 6, talking about the bishop, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Till iniquity, what was the iniquity? He was lifted up with pride. As he hovers and as he leads, and he has the whole creation at his upstroke and downstroke, leading them. You know what he says? They're following me, not him. If I do this, if I go over here, what does everybody do? goes over here. If I come over here, and you know what? He's the, the band leader. He's directing them. And you know what he does? Ezekiel 28, 17, thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Come over to Isaiah. Back to Isaiah 14. You see, folks, he was lifted up with pride. He got to looking around. He sees his reflection in the floor of the throne room, and he says, you know what? I'm pretty, I'm pretty good here. I'm all right. I'm dynamite here. I'm looking good. I got it all. And, and everybody's following me. I come over here. They come. I come over here. And he says, they're following me. They're not following God. God has allowed the, cher- the, the angelic realm to have free will, to come up with different ways of worship and praise and honor and glory. And he says, man, that's what I'm doing, and look at me. woohoo!" And he got his eye off the ball, if you will. In Isaiah 14, verse 12, prophetically, this is the end out there in the second coming, the millennial kingdom. The little flock, as Satan is going to be taken and cast down into the lake of fire. The end of the thousand years, they're going to mock him. This is a mockery, a rebuke of the adversary for what he said back in Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And what does he say? What do they say? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Wow, where did he fall? He fell from heaven. He fell from the mountain of God where God had to set him. You see, he was there. He was top. Luke 10 says, I saw Satan fall as lightning falling from the heaven. He fell. Keep reading. Gets better. Son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nation? He, here he is. He's lifted up. Keep reading. Man, this will help with understanding hell and the wrath of God and the lake of fire. By the way, what kind of fire is it? It's a fire that salts. It's a preserving fire. It's not a consuming fire. You don't die and go to hell and quit existing. 
when we go over in Luke 16 and look at the rich man and Lazarus, he didn't quit existing. He went on existing. You get the great pictures in there, great understanding doctrinally. Your soul is, has a bodily shape. It doesn't look like Casper the Friendly Ghost. I said that. Yeah. Casper the Friendly Ghost, somebody goes, who's that? I go, just, just YouTube it. Come on, you know. You, you forget, you know, age and time, who's Casper the Ghost, you know. It isn't some sheet dangling there. You, gotta, you have a bodily shape. That's why your body looks this way. He made you a living soul. There it is. And you see that. And I know what people do. They make fun of it and they mock it. Well, it's a parable. You know, if, if Luke 16 is a parable, then the reality is worse than what he's talking about. Because a parable usually lessens it up just to get it. So it's really the torments are worse than, so I don't think a parable is the way we want to go. Anyway, keep reading here. For thou hast said in thine heart. By the way, it's, the Lord wants their heart, your heart. He wants Israel's heart. The heart is the issue. Where did Lucifer say this? In his, in his heart, in his mind, in his thinking. And that's going to be critical because of the issue of when these angels sin and when they fall, they do it on their own volition. They do it by their own choice. Look, if you will, keep reading. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Notice, five times I will. Here's his plan. Here's the great lie pr program. Here's Romans 1 where they takes the truth of God and they turn it into a lie and they worship the creature more than the creator. Because who's saying this? Not the creator, the creature is. And what does he say? I will exalt my throne. Folks, this issue, the cosmic conflict between Satan and God is a one of who's running the universe. It's about a throne. That's what it is. That's why when he looks at Israel and he looks at Abraham and he says, I'm going to give you a land, your seed a land, and a tribe, and a nation, and a king. Why? Who's in charge? That's why he looks at you and I and says he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ. And then he doesn't talk anything about the physical stuff you're going to get. He talks everything about reigning and ruling in the heavenly places. Why? Because it's about who's in authority, who's in control. There are three thrones listed here. Notice them. He says, I will exalt my throne. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Those are, those are angels. So he begins to talk about a throne. And he's going to talk about the way he plans to take the authority away from God. And he's going to do it by putting himself in authority. First, he does it over the stars of God. He, he has to have someone to rule over creatures. Now, i.e., this is way before man. Okay? We're back in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You with me? Okay? What's he say? I'm going to run the universe. I'm gonna ha I have to have someone. I have to have creatures to serve me. So we have a throne of rulership and authority over Servants. By the way, that's what angels are. They're ministering spirits. They're servants. I'm going to rule over the servants. I will sit, number two, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Oh, man, everybody, oh, the sides of the north, right, right, right. Well, in the second heaven, up in the sides, in the corner of the north, there's a planet, okay? And it's where God has established a place in the universe where the angelic creatures are going to come and give an account of their activity to God. Look at Job chapter 1. Notice this. Again, man, the wisdom of God outshines the wisdom of the adversary, the wisdom of man. It's just phen phenomenal. In the millennial kingdom and in the eternity eternal kingdom, new heaven, new earth. This place is moved to the earth. 
And it sits literally in what is modern-day Lebanon, if you will, up in the northern quadrant of the land. But for now, it's Job 1. Job 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So obviously we're after the fall, right? Because Satan's listed as Satan and not Lucifer. But where did they come? They come to this mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. Chapter 2. Verse 1, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present before the Lord. Now watch, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Even Satan, after he falls, he still has to do what? Go and give an account to the Lord, to Creator, to, the, to Jehovah. Why? Because he's a created being. There's order there. Now, Satan is doing whatever he wants to do. That's why he says, where have you been? And he goes, I've been down around, walking around earth down there. And he goes, hey, have you thought about my buddy Job? You know, my guy Job. Yeah, I have. Can I have him? You can do anything you want to him but kill him. So he unloads on Job. <laughs> By the way, a picture of the little flock going through the 70th week of Daniel. And then the result in the end, where they get it all back, double, triple, quadrupled, fold, 100% all. Why? Because they maintained the course. Back to Isaiah 14. So now, not only does he have creatures to serve him, but now he has, he has these creatures come and give an account to him, answerable to him. Not just go do what I say, but be accountable to me. Follow that? What's he trying to do? Take over. Be like the Most High God. But then you got number three, the, the, the number three throne. The third throne, verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. Come over, you're in Isaiah 14. Look over in Isaiah 6. This is what he's talking about. Isaiah 6. When he talks about ascending above the heights of the clouds, he's talking about that throne of worship that God sits on. Revelation 4 and 5, we get a view into it. We get a view here in Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. And twain he covered his face, and twain he covered his feet, and twain he did fly. And he cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. You see that issue there of holy, holy, holy? That's the issue of worship. The seraphim sit there, and he's sitting in, a, in, a, in his throne room, and he has worship happening. So when you go over there to Revelation 4, and you get a glimpse in there by John into the throne room, who's sitting there? Who is worthy to open the, the sealed book? The Lamb is. Holy, holy, holy. There he is. He's the Lord God Almighty. He's the Creator. He's worthy. He's also Savior, Redeemer. Avenger, deliverer, blesser, and king. He's, he's Lord of Lords and king, king of kings and Lord of Lords. He's the only potentate, Paul calls him. I love that. So Satan comes in. Come back to Ezekiel 28. And he says, I want creatures to worship me. I want creatures that are going to serve me. I want creatures that are going to answer to me. So therefore, I will be like the Most High God. And Genesis 14 defines the Most High God as possessor of heaven and earth. What is Satan doing here? He is rebelling against God Almighty. He's in open rebellion against God's authority, against who God is as creator. He's rebelling against. Ezekiel 28, verse 16. But the multitude of thy merchandise. I'm sorry, by the multitude of thy merchandise. You know what he's got? He's got merchandise. He's got something to sell. 
It's called the lie. He's got something to sell over there to that angelic realm. It's filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of the fire. Uh, Verse 18, thou hast defiled thy sanctuary by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. What has he got? What's he trafficking? I'm God. What's he going to do in 2 Thessalonians 2? He's going to sit on that throne and he's going to say what? I'm God. See, I rose on the third day. I'm God. And he's going to cause all that is worship to come and worship him. You know, that's, it's in the Antichrist, but it's also in Satan doing it. He looks around creation. Again, what is he? He's the master conductor. Get him going this way. Get him going that way. And he says, guys, don't worry. Don't follow him. You need, you need to follow me. He looks at Eve in the garden. Yea, hath God said. Did God really say that, Eve? You know the questions. Five, you know, the subtracting. But in there, he's, he points Eve to the angels and says, he doesn't, God, there's something that God knows that he doesn't want you to know about being a God over there. You see him going up and down, Eve. Can you do that? So Eve jumps. And she didn't get very high. She goes, no, I can't fly. I want to fly. Satan says, Eve, if you join me, I will give you the illumination of wisdom and knowledge that you need to be able to decode the code so then you can fly and be like those other gods. And she goes, you know what? I think I want to do that. So she reaches over, and she takes of that grape, and she says, yep, boom. And you know what? God's, oh, and then now the rest is history. What did he do? He duped her, didn't he? By the subtil- s- subtlety, he corrupted her mind. He got her off of looking at who she was to looking at something that she wasn't supposed to ever be. He took her off of looking at who she was in Christ. Could you imagine being in the likeness of God so perfectly that you don't mess up? Hello? I do. She had it. Adam had it. He's standing right there. He could have said, hey, hang on a minute, honey. Time out. (laughs) Conference time. You know, hey, Lord, remember Numbers 13? We need a little help down here because she's about to make a vow that I need unvowed. Could have easily claimed it. He didn't. He says, oh, where have you been all my life? Good looking. Woo-hoo. And phew, off you go. What's he doing here with the angelic realm? He's merchandising. He's trafficking a lie. I got the decoder ring. I got the code, guys. I am full. Who is he? He's the sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He knows it all. There's nothing kept secret from him. That's over in 28. Three, but thou art wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that they can hide from thee. He knows it all. And he says, guys, you follow me, and you know what it'll be? It'll be like winning the Powerball every day, man. It'll be so much great. It'll be so fun. Everything will be free. Just come and do what? Serve me, worship me, obey me. And what did the, come over to Daniel. What did they do? What did the angelic realm do? They went with him. I know the verse in Revelation says a third of the angelic host, but I'm going to tell you there was more than that. Daniel chapter number 10. Daniel is on his way to give, I'm sorry, Gabriel is on his way to give Daniel a answer to a vision. Daniel 10, verse 11. Daniel 10, 11. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand uprightly, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken these words unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day thou uh, thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words." 
but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. So there's a spiritual, in the spirit realm, there's a king of Persia. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So what's happened? That angelic realm now has revolted. They have rebelled, haven't they? They have rebelled so much that when God's God's ambassador, the leader of the ambassador corps for the Godhead, Gabriel, shows up, you know what they do? They check his passport. They double-check it. They say his luggage is too heavy. It's 55 pounds. It should only be 50, so you got to wait a minute. They pull him over here and say, you know what? Your visas aren't in order to cross through our territory. And they run the governmental roll over him. And he sits there. And he waits for Michael to show up. Now, who's Michael? He's the archangel. He's the, he's the leader of the five-star generals. He's the head guy. He rolls in. And they go, okay, you're free to go. Go. Get out of here. <laughs> and then he comes down, verse, verse 20. Then saith he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So, he's, so what does Gabriel know he's got to do? He's going to go right back up there through that king's highway, through the, through the outer space, through, that, through the uh, universe, and he's gonna, he goes, and I'm going to fight them. i got to go back through. i got to go back now, and they're going to withstand me. They're going to stop. They're going to inhibit the word of God going forth. In verse 21, But I will show thee that which is noted in the Scripture of truth. Now watch. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. There's none that holdeth with me in these things. What things? The things noted in the scripture of truth. The things he just delivered to Daniel. Except for who? Michael. So when, the, when Lucifer falls... When he merchandises Isaiah 14, the lie pro plan, when he lays all that out, he instantly takes the upper echelon of the angelic realm other than Gabriel and Michael. Well, if the top goes, usually what happens then? Everything flows down, right? Okay? And when the rebellion begins, go back to Ezekiel 28, God pronounces a judgment against Satan and those angels that follow him in in rebellion. And he stops the rebellion by creating a judgment that was so horrible and terrifying that all the angels that had not joined Satan's rebellion stopped in their tracks. And what they saw was they saw the wrath of God laid out in front of them in what is called the lake of fire. And it stopped them. It put, it, it, you know... (laughs) The old preacher said, better to be hell scared than hell scorched, and it stopped them. Ezekiel 28, verse 18, you see it listed and talked about in verse 18, in the middle of that verse. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. Now he walks in the stones of fire, but he says, I'm going to bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All that they know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Woo! Right in the middle of all of that rebellion, you know what God said? He goes, I'm going to create hell. I'm going to, my attitude towards sin is very clear. And he does something so terrible and terrifying that it just stopped the rebellion. Matthew 25, 41. 
It was prepared for who? The devil and his angel. It was never meant for man. When God put man on the earth, he intended his intention for man was to subdue it and have dominion. To able to go out and win it back. Win back the reins of government and the authority that had been usurped by the adversary. But yet man fell, didn't they? You know what they did? They believed the lie more than the truth. They joined Satan's rebellion. Man was lifted up by pride, just like Satan was. That's why he created hell. It had nothing to do with you. It had everything to stop a rebellion. To demonstrate what his wrath, without indignation, without mixture, purely was going to look like. Come over with me to Colossians 1. You see, folks, he didn't just say, well, I think we're going to do a little hell today. No. He looked at the scene and said, you know what? My plan has been usurped and I need to stop it. And I have to stop it in such a manner that it stops them in their tracks. And when you and I talk about the gospel and we give the gospel, if we don't make hell a part of the conversation we then are failing in giving a clear gospel presentation. Because until man knows that there's a judgment out there that's far worse than what they think they're living in, they'll never want to get saved. They see no need for it. What did Christ do? Colossians 1, verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in heaven or things, I'm sorry, things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by, notice that, wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. When we look at the dispensational setting of it, you come over there, look at Jude. Jude 6. We'll get out here to this passage. Jude 6. Folks, the Lord Jesus Christ, He came and He went to Calvary. He took care of the, the justice of God, the sentence against the wicked works of man. He died for creation, the creatures. And the only reason he hasn't taken back everything is because he's forming the church, the body of Christ today. It's already done. In Chicago, uh, in July, my message was about Romans 4 there. God, if those things that are not, he has called them as they are. They are. It's done. He's just got some time to work out. Look at Jude 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. See how they did it on their own will. They did it. They just, God didn't make them do it. They see the daughters of men, Genesis 6 idea, and what they do? They went down there. But what did he do? He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Ooh. Why is man included in the, in the issue of hell like a fire? Because they joined the rebellion. He created it to stop the rebellion. Man has said, I'm in. So he says, okay, you're part of it now. We're involved, folks, in this conflict of the ages. And part of that is understanding eternal judgment. Because if you don't, and you don't talk about it, and you don't have it in the conversation, you're really doing Calvary a disjustice. Because in Calvary, in those three hours of darkness, you read Psalm 69 and how he describes what it is to die. 
And he says, I died your second death. All right, now what is that? Well, we'll get to it. When he says that, it isn't just because he had nothing else to do. It's because he had a plan and a purpose, and we're part of that. So why did God create hell? For Satan and his angels. Because of their revolt, their rebellion against. Why is man included in the conversation now? And that's what we're going to look at moving forward. It's because we have joined that rebellion. That's why I read that thing in, in Genesis there about man is evil from his youth. There's a point in time, and you're done. So what do we need to be? We need to make sure we're on the right side of the ledger, right? <laughs> How do we do that? It's trust, faith, faith alone in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that simple. It's not hard. It's not difficult. It's just believing it and saying, yep, that's where I need to be. Why? Well, I don't want to face that. We'll, we'll look at where it's at next time. We'll look at the conditions in there. What's happening? People think, oh, I, when I die and I go to hell, they cease to exist. No, they remember everything. Could you imagine being tormented about being by being reminded of all your failures and for eternity? And then you go dump them in the lake of fire and they're removed completely from the presence of the Lord. It's even worse. It's like... Ugh. And people, oh, you shouldn't talk about it. No, you should be talking about it. Because that's the, that's the human condition and the result of it. You ought to have this stuff clear in your mind. You ought to work it out. Look through it. Study it. Because it's, it's a key component in everything that God's doing. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Calvary and for the activity of the Savior on Calvary, and for all that He's done for us, so that He can have a group of creation of creatures that love Him, that worship Him, that adore Him, that obey Him, for the fulfillment of His purpose and His plan in all of creation in the heavenly places. And we do that because that's what you have required of us to do. In your name we pray. Amen.